finishing this up just a little bit here. Um, but that's, what I'm going to end up here with just uh, a little more thing that I started talking about earlier, but um, I started saying earlier that when I first introduced to the IMT, I thought they were little kooks and crazies too. They've changed a little bit, but uh, they were the Birkenstock crowd. They had long hair, and, and they didn't have any pictures of, dead, of teeth when, they're, when, when we lectured, and I thought that was rather odd, uh, particularly coming out of the Banky Institute and studying you know, margins and you know, all that stuff, TMJ. But the, the patients that came to me originally, before I really got serious about this, were rather different, and they still are to a great degree. And I'm going to tell you, uh, most of these folks were going to know more about what we're talking about than you do. And I don't mean that as an insult, because they sure knew a lot more about than I did. And hell, I was the dentist, you know, I was supposed to know everything. But they are on the internet, they're very savvy. A lot of these folks have been sick for a really long time. And when I say sick, maybe fibromyalgia, maybe some chronic debilitating thing where they're unable to work. And to a large part, sometimes they're broke. And what they hear from their dentist, well, their mother dentist, but also their physicians, is it's all in your head. There's really nothing wrong with you. Because all the tests that they've done on them have shown that there's nothing wrong with them. But these folks are sick. So I call them kooks and crazies a little bit, not to be derogatory, because that's the way they appeared to me at the time. But, you know, I came to love the kooks and crazy because, uh, quite honestly, our practice makes a living off those folks. I don't mean that in a bad way, but I've got a lot of kooks and crazies in my, in my practice. And the nice thing about them is that once you really stop and listen to them, and as I mentioned earlier, sometimes our, uh, our, uh, our exam process is rather lengthy. It doesn't take me that long. I get in and get out of there in 15, 20 minutes, but they'll spend a lot of time with the staff taking photographs and explaining their story. And, and, you know, it's really nice, but once you stop and listen to these people, they really, really appreciate the fact that you did and that you don't think they're crazy, that you realize that you may be able to help them. You never guarantee, never tell them I'm going to, but just the fact that I understand what they're talking about many times is enough to reassure these patients. And they know other people in similar situations. So this, again, I don't mean to sound the wrong way about this, but this can be a practice builder. Um, yeah, we're out to help the folks for sure, and, and rather selfishly, I was out to help myself to begin with because of the history of, of uh, ALS in my family. But um, there's a lot, a lot of good comes out of this. Everybody gets their hands washed. And again, these people are very knowledgeable about alternative health care. Uh, they come in with documentation. They come, they come in with things off the web. A lot of stuff I don't understand, but they're, they're appreciative, particularly with a naturopathic degree, they're, partic they're particularly appreciative of the fact that I understand what they're saying. And a lot of these people are very sensitive to different things that you wouldn't think. I mean, they know perfumes, uh, they'd be sensitive for al formaldehyde and carpet, uh, they could be sensitive to the mercury exposure in your, in your lights. They know, they may come in and do some kinesiology on themselves. Uh, do some muscle testing while they're sitting there to see if a material's good for them or not. Now, I don't recommend kinesiology. I, I believe it. I think it's the right thing to do. But in the state of North Carolina, there is no science behind it. So if you want to muscle test somebody, go ahead. Don't document it. Don't ever write it down that you did that, at least in North Carolina. But these folks, a lot of times, will hold a material in their hand to see if it's good for them. Joe mentioned, and I mentioned too, you can also do the uh, Clifford test, which is a lot more scientific. But these, these people are coming from a different direction. Uh, and again, oh, the other thing, they know how it's to be done right. Uh, Joe mentioned you can use the cleanup with or without a rubber dam. I, I take that back, with or without a vinyl dam. We used to say rubber dam meaning vinyl, but we need to be more specific. It needs to be a vinyl dam because the mercury won't penetrate the vinyl, but it will latex. Uh, but they know that a vinyl dam, or a rubber dam at any rate, should go on. So even though you can use that cleanup without the dam, I would advise it, because they know immediately if you don't, you don't know what you're doing. Because they're on the internet, they know all this stuff, and they go to the IOT website, and they're familiar with the protocol. And again, many of them have diagnosis, many, many fibromyalgia, you know that, Lou Gehrig's arthritis, headaches, chronic fatigue. A lot of patients in North Carolina have Lyme's disease. I don't know about y'all, you know, Oklahoma, Florida, uh, Texas, or what, but 
man, there's a lot of folks showing up with Lyme's. Uh, also can mimic MS. There's some symptoms that, that go back and forth there. But I must have two dozen people with chronic Lyme's disease, and they, those people suffer. They're on, they're on IVs for, uh, not IVs, but antibiotics forever, forever. And they don't see, they get better incrementally, but it's really a mess. And they're unable to function. Uh, and again, these techniques take longer. I mean, there's no question that you're going to put a rubber dam on, you're going to put all the garb that Joe showed you, you're going to invest the money and the equipment and the procedures to do this. And again, every patient gets this, not just the people who, who are coming in for mercury uh, removal. Every patient gets the same thing. You need to charge for it. I mean, you can't do all this extra and charge the same amount of money. Some people charge a mercury removal fee per quadrant. We got away from that and we just raised our fees and we just charged more for the composite or the onlay or whatever we're doing. It got to a point where, you know, you, we felt we were, if we went, did a whole quadrant of amalgams, uh, you know, it was a $150 quadrant fee or something. And if that was the wife, the husband comes in and he has a, a single amalgam in that quadrant, we felt kind of odd charging the same thing. Sometimes they got charged and sometimes we didn't. So we just went ahead and raised the fees and we did it that way. But you can do it either way you want to. But you need to charge for it. Be prepared to spend more time. They're going longer. If I've got somebody coming in who just wants to, you know, we always do kind of an interview and find out what they're interested in, what their goals are on the phone. So we know kind of what questions to ask and, and where to go from there. But um, these people are going to require more time. they got more questions. They've got more stuff to show you. So just be prepared for it. The way we're set up, um, I go in there and do what I've got to do, diagnose the problem, chit-chat with them, let them know I understand what they're talking about and their, my concerns and their concerns. And then I'll let the staff do most everything else. So I don't spend the time in there, but the patients many times are there for an hour and a half or maybe two hours. Every patient, like I said, is treated with the same protocol. And we always protect ourselves. We do everything the same every time we do it. We're basically, uh, every procedure we do is basically the same anyway. I'm either going to do uh, an onlay or I'm going to do a composite. I mean, it's just the way we do things. We're going to bond everything the same way. It makes it a lot easier, a lot more dependable. The lady was mentioned uh, earlier about sensitivity with composites. Uh, we once in a while have some, but um, when that's all you do, I guess we kind of got around it, but occasionally we do. This is an example of the Clifford test. Uh, this is a booklet you'll get back. You get two copies, one for the patient, one for, their, uh, for our and our records. And there's 6,700 products. When this was reported, this slide might be a year or two old. Um, every dental material out there is in this book. And it comes with an N or an S, meaning safe or not safe. And uh, you just have to go through this thing. Now, we check the etch. We check the bonding liquid, we check the flowable, we check everything we're going to use on that patient to make sure that can be used. Um, sometimes, you know, one, if, if you look at the MSDS, one brand of composite is the same as another except for the package. One they can use and one they can't. I don't know, there may be a difference in there somewhere, but we try to we stick right to that one now. We've never had anybody not be able to take the uh, vocal products. I use the Grandio and it's been accepted with every patient we've had. So we pretty much universally uh, accept that. The price of this test is $250. They pay, they pay the lab. We don't deal with it all. We give them the kit. They get some blood drawn. They spin it down, uh, send the serum off, and uh, it's tested in Colorado. A guy named uh, Jess Clifford owns this company. And they do a great job. And very nice to talk to, very helpful, too, on the phone. These are some publications the IOMT has out. Some of them are quite old. But it's still nice to have these in the office. We give them away to patients who they got questions and happy to help them that way. Uh, this was the original Michael Ziff. Uh, he's passed now, but he was a great guy. He was executive chairman of our organization for years. Um, he's got an older book out, but we have these on hand. This, um, I'm getting this one here. Oh, this fluoride deception, a great read. That, that is, that'll change your world if you're questioning about fluoride, why it's in our water why it's being used in dentistry, why we shouldn't use it. Uh, that is a tremendous book. It'll probably be here. I think the DAMS organization sells all these books, and if they don't, then the IOMT has some of these to offer, and they're inexpensive. I have, like I say, to give out. Here we have some IOMT pamphlets that we have more than this now. 
We have one now on fluoride that's really good to give to patients. We put these in our new patient packet and just hand it to them. And one of the things I like about particularly the crazies is I call it cookies and hugs because the people who need love the most are the ones that are hardest to love. So when these folks get done, they're the most appreciative patient you ever can expect. And most people go, God, I hate going to the dentist. You want to say, you know what, I hate you being here. But these folks, man, they, they, they pay. It's not a question of, well, my insurance won't cover that. It's like, fine. And they'll find the money. They'll find it from their mother, their father, their uncle, or somebody. But they'll get it done, and they don't squabble about it. They'll come in, and they show up, and they pay, and they appreciate you. Man, that's a good day. You increase your patient pool. You've got a very unique selling position. Uh, practicing in a little town in Yakoville, I've got some, you know, I don't call it competition, but there's people around me. Carl, he's uh, 45 minutes away. Uh, Dr. Reach, he's a uh, half hour away. But there's so many folks out there wanting this that you really have a unique product to offer. You're not just selling another filling. You're selling a service, and you're selling a health service. So one of the reasons to charge a little more for it, it's worth more. But these patients are a, a lot of fun once you get over, once I get over my ego. Staff retention. My staff, I've been practicing 32 years, and uh, my longest staff member has been there 30. <laughs> and uh, I've, we have a small team. We, there's five main members and some support people. But um, we have a unique bonus system, and we, we work four days a week, 175 days a year, I told you. But you know, that's not only the reason they stay there. They stay there because, I mean, are they going to go work for a dentist that has no mercury hygiene going on? I don't think so. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So I mean, it's, it's a family, but that's, a, that's something to consider. Uh, perceived increase in, in your excellence. Uh, I told you I had a radio show, and I go in once a month, and it's kind of like ask the dentist, and I sit down, and people call in and say, I got this tooth, this human this, you know. And I'll come in there with a topic. It's usually mercury. Or it's usually fluoride. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll talk for as much of an hour as you can get with commercials coming in and out. And uh, even though I don't know much more than other dentists, you're perceived to be an expert because you know these things. Uh, and, but you're a perceived expert, too, if you're doing this correctly. So, uh, this, I don't know, maybe it's my own charge. I like, I like the, the recognition of that, but it, it is kind of fun. An increase in acceptance uh, treatment. People are... You're the perceived expert. You're doing it right. They're going, to, they're going to accept your treatment plan. And again, I'm not trying to be a charlatan about this. And everybody gets crowns and onlays. And I treat people like I would if they just need regular dentistry. You know, you just go from your heart. They pay cash. Again, you, it, the dentist and the staff who practice this way hopefully are going to have a healthier retirement, at least not from mercury problems. Uh, Increased patient reception, we talked about that. Increased practice income. Uh, again, that's you know, it's not a dirty word to make more money. I don't have the problem in the world talking about selling in dentistry. I sell every day. I go in there and I try to find out what the patient wants and figure out a way to give it to them. Um, so I don't find that a bad word. I don't mind making money. I think it's a good thing. I work my butt off. My staff does. Like I said, we have a very, very lucrative uh, uh, bonus program. And we take a lot of vacation, and we work hard, and we get out of there. So it's all part of the package. Recession-proof your practice. Uh, I was up 13% last year, and I've been doing this for 32 years. I've been going you know, up every year. So it, it's one of those things where even in a bad economy, you can do well because, you know, there's not many of us doing this and doing it the way it should be done. Never diagnose mercury poisoning. Never tell anybody. That's what it is. Never tell anybody they're going to get better. Um, the dental boards consider that practicing medicine without a license, like Joe was saying earlier. You know, you don't want to ever, ever give somebody a chelating agent. I talked about Corella earlier and uh, cilantro. Well, you can get those at the drugstore. You know, you can get those at a health food store. They're not drugs or supplements. The FDA is trying to turn them into drugs. They may be successful in that, but right now they're supplements. But, yeah, get, get hooked up with an alternative position. In 
able to find, like I said, a, a, an alternative physician who's knowledgeable, not just, uh, all alternative physicians are originally allopathic, you know, Western trained, they just come back like we have into a different direction. But find somebody in your area, they need you, you need them, and it's just a two-way street. You're constantly funneling patients back and forth. Never, again, never promise anybody they're going to get any better. Just don't do that. And be careful with your board. Um, you know, I, I try not to be too loud, although, you know, when you're on the radio and you're advertising and, and you, the website's where they got me. They go in that website and they can study every page of that. Uh, they came back, maybe put general dentist on every page, you know, just all kinds of little goofy stuff just to harass me. But... You know, just whatever your board is, we've got a really, really conservative board, quite frankly, a pain in the butt. Carl, would you agree with that? Where's Carl? He's still here. All right. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> oh, but, you know, when you go in there, it's an experience. Anybody been before the state boards in, in your state? Anybody here? Okay, we've got a couple people. You know, <laughs> there's a panel of about eight of them. And it's like you're going into the judge, you know, and you're sitting down this little peon. You're about five feet below them in this chair with a little bench in front of you. And they just kind of look down at you like this. And it's really a humiliating kind of feeling. But, well, they do it in North Carolina. But, uh, oh, my God, I want to, never mind. This is on tape, I don't see. Um, do you use informed consent? That's a very good thing to do. Uh, do provide patients the accurate information, including opposing positions, you know. I don't go into a bunch of detail about that. I, I just tell them what I want to do and, um, you know, what we can use, and yeah, they're, they're fine with it. Keep accurate records. Document it was patient's choice to remove these amalgams. I honestly have never removed an amalgam filling that didn't have a fracture in it. I take photographs before I do everything, interoral photographs, so we document the fractures to the patient. I don't think I've ever removed an amalgam filling didn't have some decay under it. It's not hard to do that, and, you know, you're, you're okay with that. But, uh, you know, I always put in there, the patient decide to remove amalgams. Don't use alternative modalities in North Carolina. Again, state boards. I got a friend who lost his license for 45 days by e using EAV. Um, also, you know, muscle testing, although I believe in this stuff. I mean, I've, I've had it done to me, and I know it works. There's no science behind it. You can't, you can't stand, go to the board and say, this is the proof that this works, because there just isn't. I mean, we might believe it, but they won't, and they're the ones in charge. And don't antagonize your state boards any more than I have. And use treatment supported by science is what I'm basically saying. Uh, this is the copy of my informed consent. It's a little blurry, but I'd be you know, happy to send it to you guys. Anybody wants it. Advertising, distinguish the difference between mercury-free and mercury-safe. We're mercury-safe. I don't say mercury-free again. You know, fluorescent light bulbs have mercury. We're removing mercury all day long. I'm sure you went into my office, you'd find mercury somewhere just from, you know, exposure. You, you can't, you can't, it, the finest technique in the world, there's going to be mercury exposure. You, you're just going to get it. That's why we're constantly doing sarum chelation. Uh, most of the uh, holistic patients are, are going to find you on the internet. That's where they come in. I find with my marketing, uh, my radio brings a certain degree, and my radio brings in people, particularly females who are like 45 to 65, who the kids are out of the house, some discretionary income. Now they want to get their teeth fixed. <laughs> Hurrah. And then the, uh, the holistic patients, the patients who uh, are interested in the health aspect of dentistry come through the internet. So if you, and I, and I target my two audiences that way. So I would particularly interested in make sure my internet, my, what do you call it, website is, is targeted more towards the, the mercury and the environmental stuff. And my other advertising is more towards the cosmetic. Well, again, we talked about this mercury free, mercury toxic. It's just some publications that my local stuff, I do articles in, uh, write stuff. I put in things that are about vitamin D and uh, whatever, whatever I decide to write about. Join DAMS. They'll be here today. Great organization. Uh, I forgot the acronym for that. That's uh, with the, so do you remember what it is? Anybody remember the DAMS? Anyway, it's a good organization. They'll refer you patients. They really will. But you got to, they want you accredited. They want you to get, they want to make sure you know what you're doing. But they'll look at an area and like somebody calls them and you're in, you know, Jupilo, Mississippi or something. If there's anybody, 
the, the dentist and I, they'll, they'll get the patient to you. So they're well worth being with. Good organization. Tom McGuire has also got a great referral service, the internet thing. He's most likely going to be here too. We've used some of his information on our, uh, on our presentation. And the benefits of being a member, camaraderie. I've got a lot of good friends here, Joe and I particularly, but a lot of these folks uh, we're talking all the time. I happen to be, and Joe's uh, treasurer of the organization. I'll be president in, in September. So uh, we have a lot of good friendship. We, again, we do this for the love. Uh, I love to learn. I'm sure you guys do or you wouldn't be here. Uh, broader base of knowledge. Uh, patient referrals. I mean, this is a great way to get, get patients in the door. I don't know, you know, we keep hearing about recession. I don't think it's over, but we've had a couple tough years in dentistry. At least I keep hearing that we have. I haven't, thank goodness, but it's, it's, it's happened. We get a newsletter, regularly update. And we got websites, a lot of information on that website. Uh, better health through better dentistry. Unique practice position to track patients. Uh, biannual meetings, which are always held in a good place. And Dr. Tom McGuire is offering uh, abstracted articles and all that aspects of medicine. You get on his website, he's got a lot of good stuff. Okay. There's a mentor program. I used to be chairman of that. I, I kind of dropped out as I moved up the political scale here because of time constraints. But uh, anybody who needs a mentor to get started, uh, I think uh, Mark Berkowitz, isn't he mentor chairman now? Yeah. Uh, hopefully he'll be here. If not, let Joe or I know. Uh, we're happy to help somebody. We're always being mentors. But what we do is we get, uh, I'll call them seasoned members who've been in here for a while, know how to do it, know what's going on to help you. I've helped a lot of folks. It's usually over the phone. could be on the Internet. You know, we're all practicing during the day. You can't, you know, probably not going to get me at 2.30 to get on the phone and answer a question. But, you know, you can get me 6 or 7 in the evening. I'll be happy to talk with you. But the mentor program is really good um, to, to, you know, if you've got questions or having a hard time getting started. Just, just ask. I mean, don't, don't go home and worry about this. Just get it done. Uh, okay, these are your mentor chairmen, consultant mentor. Okay. Accreditation requirements. I guess you all know about that. This course is one of them. Uh, Ten two meetings. That's not too tough. We're going to be in Minneapolis in September. Great city to be. Uh, take an open book exam. Again, it's, it's fun. Oral interview, and it's not, nobody's here to, to bust your chops. It's more of a learning experience. What we're interested in making sure that you're just doing it right. You know, we're not going to check your margins. We're not going to check out, make sure the cosmetics of that case is, that's, we're not concerned about that. Submit an application, obviously. Okay, so special offer for 10 days. Is this still going on, Joe, or are we... Uh, all right. But anyway, we'll make it if it's not. <laughs> We're off hundred dollars off Tom and Paul Rubin's DVD. They've got a great DVD that's kind of like what we've done today. Only they they got some different things in there. Um, but the, it, it's, the, Tom McGuire's got some good stuff, uh, and, and Paul Paul Rubin's a really really bright guy. You'll enjoy him. You you will be able to download. This tape, right? So, at no charge. So, if you have, you know, this information, you will it will be available to you at no charge. Okay, great. Okay. Right. And is everybody really in here a member of the IMT? Yes, it does. Check, check. That's the first time we've had that happen. Yeah. Usually, usually I'm trying to get our our job to get you signed up. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. That's from the heart. All right. I keep pushing us the wrong way. Oh, and that, by the way, too, that's a great training tool just for the, um, let me go back here. Take it home. If your staff's not here, it, it, it works. All right. Well, get accredited. That's what we want you to do. Then we want you to become fellows. And again, this, uh, <laughs> this, this is Joe's slide. <laughs> He'll buy a drink at the bar. <laughs> Okay, and here's contact information for Joe and I. And again, tomorrow afternoon, I don't quote me on the time. It, I, 
But you'll have information in your packet for tomorrow, which is a separate pack for Friday and Saturday. But we will have a breakout session. The purpose of that session is to, okay, I heard what you said, but what the heck does it mean? How do I get going? What do I do? What do I do about this? Um, you know, what do I say to somebody that says that kind of stuff? So we're, we've got a very informal setup on this thing. We're not coming in with an agenda. We're coming in just to kind of answer questions. And it's like a 45-minute thing, and then you go on to something else. So I hope, to, hope you all show up, but we'd love to have you. And uh, we can give you more information on equipment, how we did it, how we got started, and blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Okay. There's your AGD code. Yep, you got to have this. Is this the right one, Joe? Yeah, that's the first. Okay. Because on my computer, it's not right. It was the Vegas code. So it's B, V, J, P, 221, 2FBD. BV, JP, 221, 2FBD. All right, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Hold on. Uh, before the questions, I have uh, Mike De Palma. Mike, yeah, I got some receipts from you that dropped out at something. If you have a question, treat have a mic, please. Joe, I'll get you one. Great questions. I was just wondering when you were talking about the amount of exposure that all of us in the office can be exposed to, uh, what do you suggest hygienists use, mask-wise? Uh, my hygienists have the same Darth Vader-looking coal miner mask that they are instructed to wear when they are polishing. And, you know, if you're scaling the amalgams, you're releasing mercury. Um, and then how do you handle that with the patients? Because how are you going to protect the patient when you're polishing their mouth? You're not. So it's, it's kind of an opportunity to bring up a conversation with the patient that hasn't had their feelings out. And, and whenever a patient comes in, the first thing we don't tell them is get all your amalgams out because they're full of mercury. I mean, we don't do that. Sure. Uh, at the point in my career now, most patients come in and tell me they're getting all their amalgams out because of mercury and they want them out. But I still have patients who just come to us because they think we're regular old dentists and they haven't got the message yet. Um, but I do instruct, and we just started really doing this. I said, gals, y'all are getting exposed. You're all childbearing age. You need to have protection. So they, they do it. And don't polish the albums. And, and they, yeah, they don't really polish the amount. No. Yeah. And don't, yeah, they don't stay off the surface. On them. Just stay off the amount entirely. Yeah. What about like a paper uh, ionizer or something like that? We have it all rooms. All rooms? Yeah. So that would help the hygienists too? Then. Well, not, not right. It's not going to clear the air that quick. It's going to help keep the levels down you know, overnight and help clear out the rooms. But as they're actually releasing, because remember, polishing, you can release up to 600 micrograms we measured. So if they actually polish the amalgams, all that, I mean, the patient's getting most of it, because the patient's taking that breath, and 80% of it, they're sober, but they exhale 30%, and then whatever just floats on out of there. So we, we don't really know how much. You can measure it. You, know, you get that drone mercury vapor analyzer and hold it right here. And then if they're wearing a cotton mask, and it... It, it uh, has any particulate on that from the splatter or whatever from the, it's probably not, but if they did, they could even concentrate it more. So the only way to protect them is give them up, just to protect their breathing, you know, to protect their respiration. What about suction type system? Uh, that, would be, that would be a big improvement, too. That would be good. Some, I will tell you, some doctors don't wear the mask and just use the high volume evacuation and think they're Superman and not going to get any exposure. But I wouldn't do it. Yeah, but you could provide a high volume suction for them too. I mean, you could really go all out. You can spend a lot of money. You now you got to decide how much of it do you want to do. Okay. Well, I was going to say for those of you who are transitioning your practices, um, 
If you have an intraoral camera, you can show the patient the fractures and marginal leakage. And oh, by the way, it happens to be a toxic material. So there's three good reasons to remove that mercury filling. And that way, you know, your existing patients that you've seen for 10 or 20 years that you haven't mentioned their mercury fillings, uh, you have a better basis. It's not just because it's mercury. It also happens to be one of the reasons a good idea to remove it. And the, the other thing we do is we give those, those patients time to get educated who aren't educated yet. And so we've gone over a treatment plan, and they've got a lot of metal and mercury in the mouth. We've shown them all the cracks and teeth, and we've done the things that most dentists do. Uh, we also give them one of those books, whichever one you like best, like Tom McGuire's book or one of the books on, that uh, Dr. Ziff wrote. We, you would just give it to them. Say, here, take a look at this, too. So it's not any high-pressure techniques or twisting their arm to get it done. They let us know. Because, you know, most of it's elective dentistry. It's... it's the stuff that's mandatory, and that's the terms we use, that I use, I tell them what's mandatory to do for their, for their tooth, to save their tooth or keep it from getting worse. The other stuff, I say it's elective. And you tell me when you want to have it done. But uh, probably, probably about 60 to 70% of the patients who come through the door want to get it all out as soon as they can. And there's a lot in my hygiene practice that they're... You don't have to worry about it because there's no mercury in your mouth. You know, there's very few patients that really have mercury in their mouth that are repeatedly going through hygiene. You know. I just had a question about. I just had a question about being in the field for so long. I, uh, you know, I, I've had chelation before, and I'm just wondering. I don't think the mic's working. I've had I've had the treatment of you know getting the metals out, but my gosh. Um, I don't know that I ever checked to see if it was the mercury I got out. It was it was actually a chelation for a, a plaque in my arteries and stuff. Oh, was it EDTA? EDTA. Yeah, yeah. that takes out uh, calcium yeah. real well and lead. He should have had the uh, yeah. That's EDTA is mercury. Rectally is a good chelator for mercury, but not as well IV evidently. Um, but I mean, it gets in. You know, like you're talking about. Well. Not like I don't know if it got out of my brain either. I mean, yeah. we don't know that. Okay. Okay. There's no way to know if we got it out of what tissue. I've got these 20 inch IVs of EDTA, just for just for lead. Because we, after I got the mercury out, lead showed up, and then well, what the heck? We'll also do it for. Per personally, I think we should constantly chelate with some natural products like clays or uh, uh, there's a pectisol that Duke created, OSR if it ever gets back on the market. Um, which is probably one of the best ones you should be taking all the time. And then um, I go, I was until my doctor changed, but now he's back to solo practice. So I, I usually like to go quarterly and get some IV chelation done, some EDTA, vitamin C, that kind of stuff. Really, really oh, yeah, you sure can. And, you know, the cardiologist will, will tell you that can't clear your uh, black and stuff out of your arteries, but I've, I've, I've seen patients who were supposed to have bypasses that were doing chelation when I was doing it and refused to have a bypass, and then all of a sudden they could uh, go out and run and exercise and shortness of breath went away, so something must have happened. I see common with diabetic patients that have like a blue foot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, they come back after 40 chelations. I mean, that's a lot, but... Uh, the foot's pink, you know, and I've, I've been sitting next to them in the chair getting chelations over a period of time, and you'll just see uh, the improvement in the circulation. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling chelation, I'm just saying it's yeah. something I might want to look at again. Hi, right, what, what, what time's the board meeting? What question? What time's the meeting? Uh, the board meeting's in about uh, 20 minutes. This is about 30. Okay, we've got time. Uh, I have a fluoride question. Uh, good. I'm a real uh, lover of glass ionomers. And I know that glass ionomers have sort of a natural, you know, component of fluoride to them, not an additive, not an added component of fluoride. And in my own, you know, clinical experience, you know, I, they really seem to prevent recurrent caries, particularly root caries. So where, where, what's the position on uh, the use of glass ionomers? Uh, there's not, there's not an official position. We don't have one. Do you guys, don't, do you guys feel, they, that. Do you feel it's detrimental? Uh, no. Thank you. I would, um, I mean, you need to ask Dave Kennedy, one, but um, we're, 
we're basically not too worried about topical fluoride. No, we don't think it works or does much. And the little bit that's in the fill-ins, um, I'm not sure what it does. We, we're just not convinced fluoride has much to do with preventing decay. Although clinically, something in that glass armor is helping to prevent those root caries, which is really a tough thing for us to deal with, right? My understanding so we would never tell you to not use it. My understanding is I'll tell you, we don't know, and I don't think we have a studies on it. Yeah. My understanding is that in the manufacturing process, it's made with glass that is made with a fluoride flux, and that's where it be, it gets its its uh, fluoride component to it, and you know, and, and, it, and it seems to be cario resistant, or you know. Uh, help prevent recurrent caries. So, you know, right. it's uh, sort of on the other side of the offense that fluoride doesn't work. It seems like if indeed it's the fluoride in the glass ionomer, it seems well, like it does work. Systemic fluoride doesn't work. Fluoride in the water doesn't prevent tooth decay. I think that's what our, our position is. Did I miss part well, of you know, David it? said today uh, if fluoride works topically, it's because it slows down the bacteria. He didn't say it killed it. He said it slowed down the respiration. You know what he said? I think that's what he said. So I'm sure it's having some kind of effect. And uh, I don't think you're harming the patient systemically with it. But he's a, he's a, he is one of the experts. Okay, well, I'll grab him. Uh, Griffin Cole, days. if you know Griffin or catch him, you'll see Griffin here. Mm -hmm. um, he, he knows a ton about fluoride and materials also. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, we uh, we have a meeting to get to. Uh, we, have, we have a board meeting tonight, open to membership. It is, isn't it? Yeah, at 530, anybody, I think you can attend if you want to get bored to death. It's in here. <laughs> you can't vote, but you can come in. You can be in it. Here's our president. Are you Thank <laughs> you.